Hello, everybody. Um, I'll give a few seconds for everybody else to come into the conversation and then we'll get started. And as you're joining, if you don't mind shutting off your cameras, that would be great. Just a few more minutes, I can see people still joining. Okay, very good. I'm Welcome everybody and we're glad you could join us today. My name is Leandra Roos and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Cirrus and Ahima for today's discussion on the challenge of medical record retrieval and procurement. Um, medical record retrieval is a vital component of risk adjusted programs and remains a labor intensive challenge for many payers. Efficiency is a must, especially given stringent CMS submission deadlines and targets that are difficult to achieve. A comprehensive data intake and an analytics process is essential for obtaining the highest possible medical records retrieval rate. During this panel discussion, you'll learn about how you can address provider friction and procurement challenges to successfully navigate the task of getting necessary medical records for review. The panel will, share, will, will share best practice tips about how to ease these challenges and how to build relationships with payers and establish payer payment integrity. We'd like to thank Cirrus for sponsoring today's discussion. At the end of the discussion, we'll have time for a live Q&A, so please submit your um, questions via the chat function. Now I'm pleased to introduce Julie Persley, Ahima's Senior Director of Bot Leadership. Julie, please introduce yourself and share some thoughts on medical record procurement and why it's important we're having this discussion today. Sure. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, thank you. I'm excited to be here with James and Jeannie today. And thank you to our listeners for joining. My name is Julie Persley. I'm Senior Director of Health Information Thought Leadership at Ahima. In my role, I lead and participate in discussions like these, and they're so important to the overall integrity of health data as it moves through the healthcare ecosystem. As this discussion unfolds today, I would like for you like to ask that you think about the data and how it makes its way through multiple workflows and processes to ultimately uh, being shared in a vast network of systems and stakeholders. And let's not forget people like you and me, the patients and our beloved family members, uh, where we depend on, as patients and family members, we depend on this quality documentation to support our care and to support our family's care. So I'm excited today uh, to about today's chat to learn more um, from our experts on the challenges of record retrieval and procurement. So back to you, Leanne. Great, thanks, Julie. Um, now we'll hear from James Contos, Vice President of Operations for Cirrus. James, please introduce yourself and tell us about how about Cirrus and how you got involved in this area. Absolutely. Uh, again, welcome everybody. I look forward to today's um, discussion. As she said, my name is James Contos. I'm the Vice President of Operations for Cirrus. Cirrus is a payment integrity uh, service company, so uh, we've been in the business for over 30 years, uh, providing audit and or review services uh, for the uh, insurers. And we primarily are an itemized bill review and a DRG uh, review company uh, to ensure really that the bill is accurate and it's paid accurate. I and mean, that's really the bottom line of what we do. Uh, when you start looking at some of the specialty reviews that we do, when you get into beyond your traditional itemized bill or medical or DRG, you know, there, there are other aspects of it, whether you have a, a part of it is, is an implant review or a transplant review, um, even a hospice review here recently, which, um, you know, is something that's, uh, you know, newer to the, uh, to the arena. But really, it, it, like I said, at the end of the day, the goal is a accurate bill and an accurate payment. And we're there to make sure that, you know, that is done um, so that everything you know, flows through easily, as Julie mentioned, from A to Z. 
Great, thank you so much, James. Um, now we'll hear from Jeannie Hennam, CEO of Chartfast. Um, Jeannie, please tell us about yourself and how you became involved in this chat. You bet. So hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I am Jeannie Hennam. I am the CEO of a company called Chartfast. Um, but I have been actually in the healthcare IT industry, um, and it's going to be shocking, for over 26 years. <laughs> Anyway, um, my, my background includes working with payers and with providers. Um, so from claim systems to HEDIS to risk adjustment um, to health information management, release of information. Um, I've got you know quite a bit of expertise in, in all of those areas. Um, I'm probably one of the few people who think that medical record retrieval is equally as fun as release of information. <laughs> yeah. That being said, um, our company, Chartfast, um, sits in a very unique position. We are both a medical record retrieval vendor on behalf of the payers and their vendors for coding, um, as well as we are a release of information vendor, meaning we work with hospitals, health systems, clinic groups to um, distribute and manage their uh, medical records to ensure you know, the timeliness uh, of this uh, situation. Um, and by the way, before joining Chartfast, for all of you health information management professionals out there that are on this call, um, I didn't know what I didn't know about release of information and all the intricacies of it, and I have the utmost respect for you. So thank you for what you do. You protect our PHI and protect the integrity of our data. So I'll give it back. <laughs> Great. All right, we'll get started with the discussion. Um, so from what you are seeing in the industry, what are some of the ongoing challenges organizations face in medical record retrieval and procurement, and how does the importance of turnaround times in procuring medical records play into risk and compliance? Mm. So Jeannie, why don't you start us off? Okay, I'd be happy to. Um, and again, I believe the perspective that I bring to the table is going to be different than just what I would call a standalone medical record retrieval company or a medical record slash coding company because of the fact that we um, you know, work with our hospitals so closely. Um, I think that the biggest challenge that we see is the multiple points of entry when it comes to requesting those medical records for payment integrity. Um, and it just happens to be very timely. Um, late last week, we experienced um, a situation, a very similar situation where the um, vendor on behalf of the health plan looking for medical records for claims review um, sent the request to the wrong person. Um, and it sat on a desk for weeks before it then got pushed into the correct hands and in health information management which then in turn was turned over to our company to process. Um, that delay um, posed, you know, with all of those multiple points of entry, and I have done case studies in the past um, with previous um, companies and, and current company, um, those lost requests when you can't find them where they're not coming in, um, also equal lost possible revenue for the health information management for the hospital itself. Um, and that becomes quite a problem when you when you look at that. Um, the one study that we just recently did, there were eight different points of entry for where medical records were being sent throughout the health system. Um, and that total decentralization ended up, you know, like with, with much chaos and much risk for the hospital. So um, that coupled with your delivery methods, you know, when you're talking about delivery back from a health information management perspective, you've got to look at HIPAA, you've got to look at that authorization letter, you've got to make sure you're delivering that record in the, the most, um, you know, compliant manner possible, um, you know, and that there could, that could be delivery via fax, via mail, via, you know, um, portal uploads, et cetera. Um, so again, you know, and, and this kind of goes back to, <laughs> this has just been my my lucky week, I guess, between last week and this week. Um, but we also had the same issue with delivery to one of those vendors um, where the records were perfect, they came out of the health system perfectly, then they were processed and delivered directly through a secure FTP. Um, but and when the vendor picked it up, they looked at it, they could see it, but the vendor's technology, when they went to push it into their system, corrupted the files. So there's all kinds of nuances, and that particular um, problem actually resulted in almost take back to our hospital customer. Um, so these are the things that we need to solve. These are the big problems that we see, the decentralization of request and delivery. 
and, so, and I would add on to that, you know, as a, you know, as the vendor trying to get those records, I mean, we see those exact same struggles. Uh, our call center representatives, you know, our experienced call center, they're experienced in healthcare. They're, they go through a lot of training. Our system will track and acknowledges uh, the way certain uh, provider locations or certain health systems need or want to be contacted. But even with all that information, when we reach out to um, the particular provider, we're not always made aware of that they're using an ROI vendor or that the request should come in directly to the hospital first or should it go to the ROI vendor because we see it we see it both ways. Uh, we don't know when changes are made. They they go from one ROI vendor to another, or they go completely away from using ROI and they're handling all the requests internally. And those changes are consistently, um, you know, the, those consistently change, and it's very hard to to track. And then also, you know, you have situations where maybe you have a centralized area. Uh, for 10 different hospitals and another system with each individual hospital contacted. And so it really, it does that decentralization really makes it a challenge. And again, our goal is to get it done as quickly as possible and accurately as possible and to try to change or to cut down some of those barriers uh, would really speed up the whole process and make everything, you know, more accurate. Great. Julie, did you have any comments on this? You know, um, I, I think I'd like to share a personal story, if that's okay. It kind of um, folds in kind of the, the, um, the consumer engagement piece. And that is, um, you know, over the years, as I'm sure my co-presenters and lots of people on this call have done in the, in, because we're in the field, right? We've, I've helped multiple family members and friends navigate the system to access their, and request their records. And the older crowd is always thankful for my help and often takes more a more relaxed approach to it, um, to its complicated, uh, untimely process sometimes. Um, but our younger generation is, is, is not so um, forgiving, let me just say. So uh, my son who and his peers who are in their 20s um, are really quite intolerant to this complexity um, that is inherent in our systems right now. And, um, and we were looking for something, this has been a couple of years ago, we were looking something uh, for something particular in his record. And um, because I uh, have contacts in the field, um, you know, we, we requested his records, they were delivered, um, but it was not there, what we were looking for. Even though we wrote it in the note, we're looking for particularly, they couldn't find it. So because I had worked in that system before and I knew where it likely might be, um, I called the director. Um, I had that, that, uh, that I was, you know, not everybody could do that, but I had, I had that contact. So I contacted the director and had a conversation with them. And we together figured out where this might be, the ex exact place. And so with her guidance, she was able to go to the staff and say, I think you need to look here um, in the historical record. Um, and they found it. But without that guidance, we would have never probably been able to find that. And so it was really a lesson for, for both of us. But for my son's vision, um, it was not his reality. His reality was that everything could be done electronically and that um, he didn't need to talk to anybody. Um, so I think that's, you know, it's something to keep in mind as we, as, as our systems mature, as technology um, advances, it's, um, you know, we want to get to that place where his reality is, but, but we're not quite there yet. So that is just a, a personal story I thought I'd share. Um, and I'm going to turn it back to you again, I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, so let's get to some of those technology solutions. You know, what do you see are some of the solutions that the industry will be adopting in the next, say, five to 10 years? Jeannie, would you like to start on that? Sure, of course. 
Um, so I, I see quite a few different um, evolutions that we have out here. Um, and one, I think, obviously addresses what you just described, Julie, is the ability to, quote unquote, shop for your medical records, just like an e-commerce platform, just like you would for anything else. If you go to Amazon, you'd have your shopping cart. You look for your medical record. You look for your patient billing. You look for your x-rays or radiology images, um, being able to you know, order everything in one fell swoop and have, you know, everything delivered electronically. Nobody wants to talk to people anymore. Nobody talks to Amazon hardly at all anymore, right? I mean, every once in a while you have an issue. So I see the trend continuing to move towards an e-commerce platform. Um, I also think that interoperability will help with that too. Um, and, you know, I think that, um, and I'll let James, you know, continue down um, with other ideas, but I do see that, um, and I believe just from what I'm seeing in the industry, that we're going to have more of that patient engagement type functionality available to us. And I, for one, will be very thankful of that. <laughs> no, I, I definitely think that is going to happen. We're already, we already are seeing that. I think the thing to keep in mind is that um, it, it really takes everybody's cooperation and i know that the providers have a, a big burden and lots of requests coming in from lots of different areas and their goal or their function is patient care and and you know providing medical records and and you know doing other things that are extraneous to patient care sometimes can be seen as a burden the uh, the payers obviously are wanting an accurate bill and making sure that things are right and sometimes not everybody plays well in the sandbox and really it's going to take that cooperation technology can solve a whole lot of stuff but you also have to have the cooperation from all the parties involved and that would obviously include an roi vendor where everybody is on the same page we all just want an accurate bill and an accurate payment and we can use technology to make those requests easier to get them faster but i still also believe because you're dealing with billions and billions of dollars the, the it and i i know you've heard me say this it has to be accurate and you know ocr and artificial intelligence and and there are softwares out there that now can you know quote unquote do a review with little to no human intervention but when you make a as little as a five percent error rate which if you said hey it's 95 percent accurate probably most of us would go hey that's great but when you're dealing with you know again billions of dollars over the, you know, when you look at everything United pays or you take a really large health system like HCA and you have a 5% error, I mean, that's gigantic dollars. And then you have to then reconcile it on the backside. And so now everybody's having to touch the claim multiple times. And so really, I do see elect electronics and, and artificial intelligence playing a huge role, but you also are going to have to have all kinds of checks and balances, and you're going to have to have human intervention to ensure the accuracy of those bills while cutting down touches and, and creating more speed. I couldn't agree with you more, James. And when you, when you talk about that 5%, if you have a population of 100 uh, patients, let's just say, 5% of that is five people. And five people's bills uh, could be wrong. You know, their, their care could be jeopardized um, if, it, if we're talking about clinical documentation. So absolutely. Right. And, you know, it's, it's people process and technology. Um, it's a combination of those. We talk about that in, in the area that I am most passionate about, which uh, patient matching, you might hear a little bit more of that as we go along today. Uh, but, you know, we talk about that it's, it's not, you know, a uh, magic bullet, uh, uh, sil uh, silver bullet, I'm sorry. So, yeah, um, magic Either. pill or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, it is, you know, it's, it's a combination of all those things. And I will say... You know, talking about the technology, um, artificial intelligence, of course, is going to continue to advance. And, you know, there's great promise in it, automating functions that previously have been manual. Um, but from a workforce perspective, 
I would add that while that great, you know, it has great potential for streamlining processes, human attention, like you said, will need be needed. Um, you know, we've got this sea of algorithms out there that are working in the background to ensure that things are performing in accordance with desired outcomes, right? And I would say that this is a huge, uh, tall order um, for for us to address uh, as an industry, considering the the amount of data, the volume of data that's out there and that's being captured in our systems today. Um, you know, investments need to be made in data quality um, so that the information is be, being, the information that's being used can be trusted and um, additionally strong data and information governance structures should be prioritized. Thanks, Julie. Let's shift focus a bit. Um, how is the payment integrity industry currently addressing data quality and are you seeing greater shift towards prepayment? James, how about starting us off? Yeah, I think that dovetails into what we were just talking about. I mean, we definitely are looking at um, how to ensure that that data is accurate. And again, I mentioned earlier that, you know, OCR is, is definitely helping to scan thousand page records or, or large bills to ensure and ingest that into our system. But again, you have to have different checks and balances that allow that to make sure that it is accurate. I think, you know, Julie, you were just talking about the hard to find that one part of the record. And again, we see the the AI part of it, hey, well, this is the discharge summary and this is the H and P. And then you go in there and you don't see it. And, and the immediate assumption is, well, it's uh, it's just not there. And so then a second request goes back to the hospital to say, you know, hey, we didn't get the HMP, but yet it was there. Just the technology didn't um, didn't find it. And so, you know, we at least for Cirrus, we have a large staff that are trained in medical records, so that they're double checking those records to make sure it's there. We've instructed the the coding auditors to make sure again, don't just trust blindly what the system is saying, making sure and looking for um, missing records or things that it says are not there. So it's it's really making sure that up to that point it's accurate. And then on the back end, there's multiple QC steps to make sure that again the, the coding review or the atomized bill review is right. And then even taking it one step further, I mean, after the review is completed, even having some additional back-end QA process that is then looking for um, accuracies and training opportunities, again, to make sure system tweaks, um, to make sure that uh, the, the bill is, or the, the review is accurate as possible. The second part of your question, or the second part of the question was about prepayment. And, from an itemized bill perspective, which I know is not the medical records team that's, that's here, but you know we've done prepay in that space for years and years and years, and really it's it's something that's now become the norm or the standard. But the itemized bills are smaller, and they're generally more readily available, and there's usually not as many requests that are going on. And so when you flip it over and start looking at a hospital bill audit or a DRG audit where you do need the medical records, you know, now you are, you know, you're talking about 10, you know, sometimes very, very large records. Some the, the, the review itself takes longer to do because again, you're, you're looking at more stuff and just the fact that, um, it's there's tighter windows when it comes to prepay and some of the rules and regs that are that are in there and and when you when you encompass everything we've been talking about from the, the bill getting to the to the payer that information getting to us us trying to get the information out to the hospital and and figuring out decentralization who gets that record the the uh the medical records departments getting requests from attorneys or getting requests from other auditors or getting requests from other parts of the hospital or getting requests from other hospitals because that patient may be going somewhere else. There's just a lot to fulfill. So that I think 
we will get there when it comes to prepayment in a medical record space. It, it's just going to take a little bit longer. And again, it's going to take cooperation across the board. I think most everybody would agree, especially if you talk to the CFO of the, com of the hospital, I think they would much rather touch it one time, the bill's accurate and it gets paid accurate versus getting paid and then having to turn around and, and go back into and have an audit done and then decide that either it was underpaid or it was overpaid and now an adjustment has to happen. And so then they get to reconcile a new payment. If you could do it cleanly on the front end, that you'll eliminate the majority of that, but it's going to take cooperation. Thank you, Jeannie. Yeah, so just um, I think just to tag on to to what you're saying there, um, James, I think that with the data quality, um, you know, there's technology solutions always in, in place. But I think even before that record, you know, with a prepay, you still have your medical record, putting it through a proper quality assurance process to ensure it's not a commingled patient, because you would be surprised how many records that we receive um, in our intake department for our retrieval projects, I'll bet you it's at least 2% of every project file that we handle has commingled patients. Why? At the beginning, when it was originally scanned in, somebody scanned it wrong. It starts with a human error. So ruling that out, applying the NPIs plus the um, optical character recognition, and I'm always careful when I'm talking to a heap of people, it's not OCR like your audit. <laughs> it is optical character recognition. Um, just making sure that the, the record is sent at the front end, um, you know, in the right way. And then also, I think one of the important factors that, um, that vendors leave out, that um, requesters leave out, and even the HIM department sometimes I've seen as well, um, is just updating and cleaning up the bad data that does go out. So when you have these programs that are creating this, you get reports, technology is wonderful for telling you what you did wrong. And then nobody acts on it. So giving this actionable feedback back to the health system so that they can correct that truth, the source record um, to make sure it is right and it doesn't happen again, that's huge. When you're talking about reviews for your coding, giving back that information and making sure that they know, because all the hospitals that I work with in my entire career all want that feedback. What did we do wrong? And most companies will not give that back. So I think, you know, again, we talked about communication um, back at the beginning of this conversation. Um, and I think that looping in and also, you know, being able to provide that type of communication, intelligent data back um, is going to be critical to, you know, the, the forthcoming um, patient empowerment or however you want to call that, having them more involved because goodness, you don't want to give the wrong patient wrong data. Julie, did you have anything to add here? Oh, yes. Uh, Jeannie, you had me at co-mingle. <laughs> I will just tell you, you had me right there. So, you know, um, if for those of you that know me, uh, you know that I never miss an opportunity to talk about data quality, specifically where it relates to um, patients that are uniquely matched to their health record. So, mm -hmm. It's our duty as health information professionals to provide high quality data. Um, this helps us to ensure that the data is accurate, complete, and timely. And my uh, glasses are fogging up and I'm just gonna take like one second here so that I can see. So it might be a good thing, there we go. Um, so to ensure that the data is accurate, complete, and timely. Those are the three components that we talk about when we talk about high quality data. And we talk about it throughout the health information life cycle. So data quality begins with patient identification and matching, just like Jeannie was just talking about. Um, if the individual is not currently matched to their previous records, um, data quality is compromised. It could be compromised because it quickly cascades to other systems and care decisions could be based upon that misinformation, unfortunately. So earlier this year, AHIMA published a naming policy, which has caught the attention of key stakeholders in our industry. And since there is no national patient uh, matching strategy, which I uh, addressed in the chat there, um, which we are working on. Um, we are working um, with a group called uh, Patient ID Now um, to, to um, 
advocate for that on the Hill. Um, but the naming policy, um, which I can put in the chat after I get through talking here, um, is uh, sets forth guidance and best practices for naming conventions when capturing patient demographics at the time of the patient's visit. So I'm talking about data elements like first name, last name, middle name, addresses. Uh, we just worked with the ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator, on a project um, to standardize patient addresses. It's called uh, Project USA. And it also outlines, this naming policy also outlines, you know, multiple names, um, newborns, and unidentified individuals. It's, it's a pretty uh, comprehensive docu document, so I would invite you to take a look at that. Um, I would also recommend, from a data quality perspective, checking out the Office of the National Coordinators um, PDDQ, the Patient uh, demographic data quality framework. Um, this offers guidance for small and medium uh, ambulatory practices when they're planning a quality approach. So I will put those both in the chat, but um, yeah, it's, you know, data quality starts with identifying our patients. And, uh, and if Jeannie, if you're seeing that and uh, we're there mm -hmm. commingled, um, it is, it's, it's, um, you know, if we could start and, and work on our standards of how we're collecting it. It'll be better by the time it gets to you and better by the time it gets to James and better by the time it gets to the patient. Yeah, exactly. And just uh, one more tag on on that. Um, yes. So as a retrieval vendor, when we get the what the chart chase list, which records are we going to go get the medical record retrieval list from our clients there again? It's not just one side of the data system. It's not just the EMR system. It is also the claims payment systems too. Um, and, it, uh, and I still firmly believe, I've worked in claims adjudication systems for many years, um, but by giving back that intelligence, um, you know, this is, this is incorrect. The next time you give us this, you know, update your claim system to show us this. You know, it, we, we, can, we can improve, Julie, you and I can, and, um, and James, we can improve this whole industry. I know we can. <laughs> Go team. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how consumer empowerment is playing a role in ensuring payment integrity and record procurement. Um, Julie? Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk, speak to the um, AHIMA standpoint here. So First of all, AHIMA recognizes that while the affordability of healthcare affects many, many entities, including employers, governments, and health plans, we're focused on policies that enhance affordability for individuals to make informed decision about their and their families' healthcare. And um, again, when I stop talking, I will put that in the chat. I, I'm behind a couple of links here, but I will do that. Um, we have an affordable policy statement that I will put in the chat for you to take a look at. The second thing is um, that I want to say is improving patient access to information is one of AHIMA's 2022 advocacy priorities. Uh, we support individuals and their caregivers' electronic, timely, and seamless access to their health information, and we advocate for the rights of individuals and their caregivers to access their health information, regardless of where it's captured, stored. In line with our mission statement, which is empowering people to impact health, we believe that individuals should be empowered to make decisions about their own health care uh, using trusted data. So it goes back to everything that we were just talking about, um, that it, it has to be trusted, it has to be correct and accurate and timely for it to be trusted. And um, the other thing I will just say here is that um, we're talking about environments of not only the traditional environment that we're in today, what we may be talking about um, for the most part here today, but also in non-traditional. We've got some non-traditional um, areas that are coming up. We have third-party apps that are 
um, quickly that are may not be supported by HIPAA at this particular point in time um, that where your information is out there and they're collecting data. Um, so, yeah, so I would say um, that there's much, much work to be done there, but um, hopefully that gives you an idea of where AHIMA stands and, and I will, I don't know who I'm punting to, James or Jeannie? I think you know we um, don't typically engage with the patient, but but we really do take a role here in that you know of the 500 employees that work here at Cirrus, 130 of them are nurses and coders, and they all came from you know patient care or worked inside a physician's office or inside the hospital, and and they got into that industry because they care about the patient and just because they're now no longer doing bedside care and they're you know here with us they still do care about the patient and i think somebody said it earlier on in the in the conversation that you know bills that are in in accurate and be a burden to the patient it, you, you know you have a copay that you're paying on incorrect charges and then you know incorrect charges just burden the whole healthcare system um, and and the goal is for it to be accurate and so we really truly here at Sears believe that we're working on behalf of the patient and ensuring their bills are correct and and that's really you know kind of how I see the movement is patients getting more involved apps being able for them to, to check their you know, cost and things out there, and then the payment integrity industry is there to ensure that that is accurate. Great, Jeannie. Yeah. So, okay, this is a little bit personal to me. I'll tell you that in a minute. But, um, but you know, we do deal with patients. We deal with patients all day long. Um, I was one of those patients as well that you know went to a physician's office and needed my medical records timely. Um, and then I moved and all that good stuff and not being able to get my records on a timely basis was, was really quite burdensome. Um, also, what I find very interesting is um, people have gotten wind that there are vendors out there who take your data and they say it's theirs and now they're selling your data. And that from that consumer perspective, it's, it's, um, it's concerning all the way around for a lot, for a lot of different reasons. Um, to me, like I said, you know, people are so quick too with apps. And I always tell my tell everybody that I know, read the fine print, even if it's boring, read it anyway. For example, 23andMe, when you sign up for that, they own your DNA after you give that to them. They do lots of great things with it, but they are also, you know, can be used against you at some point in time. So I think the biggest concern that I'm seeing here um, you know, I think that the patients need to be empowered. I think that the patients need to see all of their data all in one place, not from, you know, 50 different EMR systems because they've moved or, you know, they're military, so they're all over the country. Um, everybody moves every day now. It's not us, you know, that, that hometown um, mentality too much anymore where someone stays in the same place their whole life. So there's a lot of different service providers involved. Um, and I think that as we continue to watch how consumers, um, start to be empowered with their own data i think they should also be included it used to be i think an autobiography the data belonged to the provider and to the patient now it seems like there's some unr systems and 23 andme's that say no no it belongs to me it's my data now so i think setting things back to involving the patient bringing them back in and you know putting it back together into the right hands and making it truly an autobiography again without removing the health information management professionals. Again, they're the last defenders of your data, whether it's from your consumer perspective or from your hospital perspective. Like you said um, earlier, James, you know, technology can do things. Technology makes mistakes sometimes. You know, if we don't have that human touch, if we don't take percentage of that out and apply a special QAs to that, apply the special um, education that it takes to really, um, you know, make sure that we're adhering to the rules of release of information. Um, you know, I think I think that it's really gonna be critical to make sure all parties are involved and all that communication continues. But I do see it moving and I think it's gonna be a wonderful thing because people are smart, they're savvy and they want their data. Thanks, Jeannie. Um, so we have a, you know, a few minutes left for a final question, but 
um, for those of you listening, if, uh, we will have some time for Q&A at the end, so please submit any questions you have um, through the chat. Um, and I'm going to start with James and just, you know, do you have any final thoughts for us or additional, you know, best practices or guidance to share, you know, for organizations and, you know, how they can avoid um, revenue, revenue being reversed on future claims? Yeah, you know, I think, um, again, it's just going to take cooperation amongst all the parties. And I just uh, one example right now, we've got a very large payer and a very large health system that is actually having those deep discussions right now. And it is out of the norm. And it, it, we are looking at things that we've never done in the in the past to try to solve that problem. But it took it really took the key players at each organization to say, hey, there's a better way. And, you know, maybe three or five years from now or maybe sooner, there's some additional electronic solutions. But right now it took the key players at each of the three organizations to say, how do we solve this? And let's break down the barriers and let's have that conversation. And, you know, I can't go into a whole lot of detail, but it's really a way to solve the, the prepay medical record um, obstacles that we've had in the past, and uh, I'm really excited of what that would do because, again, it's it's a very two very large organizations, and if it works there, then it could work at other payers, it could work at other providers, and it would be potentially, you know, a game changer um, as we move towards additional technology out there. But it 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 I truly believe it it takes the cooperation of everybody to sit down with a level head and say, we've got a problem, how do we solve it? So, Janie, what are your final thoughts and, and some key takeaways you would like for people to have from this conversation today? I think um, to add on to James's comments, um, you know, with, with getting the parties together to talk about, you know, the different ways, the different solutions, how do we work better together? Um, there's that. And then you also have to think about, too, um, it, and and how do I want to say this without, I want to make sure I say it the right way. I'll just say it. The, I'm, I'm always straightforward. So okay. Just to say it the right way is making sure that, you know, from a compliance perspective, you're the HIM department, making sure that your ROI vendor, because, again, this is a hurdle that we face as a retrieval vendor and that we take down as a, as a release of information vendor, taking down the hurdles on those copy fees. You know, I'm not going to bill James um, $150,000 for this medical record. No, I'm going to bill him the allowable rate. Um, but I think that that's a lot of the problem, too. So making sure that you iron out what is contractually, um, you know, the payment that is contractually obligated between the provider and the health plan. I mean, there are state rates, there are federal rates, and then there are what I have called the do the right thing rates, which is you make sure you're honoring the other agreements that are in place. Um, it's all about compliance as well. Great. Um, what about you, Julie? What are some key takeaways from today's discussion and where we go yeah. next? Yeah, I think uh, James and Jeannie, thank you so much. This has been such a great conversation. A lot of um, a lot of synergies here in our messages and. I would just encourage, you know, um, you know, the HI professional in these organizations, seek them out, um, have them, you know, we are um, by trade um, a really great connector of people, process and technologies. Uh, we, we work with so many different uh, departments in our organization that we can help connect. And like James was saying, if we all work together, um, even though the complexity of it all seems overwhelming sometimes, we just sometimes have to step back and take a look at the bigger picture and and uh, see what we can do to move forward. Um, and then I would just say, you know, focus on, of course, I'm going to say this, you know, I'm going to say this, focus on data quality. Um, and, um, and that's, that's a big, that's a biggie, um, cause if we're not getting the, the, the right data, uh, connected to the, the person, then you're going to have those commingled. Um, I love that word, by the way. Well, I don't love it from a, you know, what it is, but I love that word, um, commingled, um, 
you know, you're going to have those patients that are genie in my records that could be together, um, mm -hmm. which is not a good thing um, when it comes to our care. So I think that's it. Thanks, Leanne. Perfect. Again, if you have questions, you could submit them to us um, via the chat function. Um, I do have a couple of questions to start us out. Um, what technology is available to centralize the MRR process for the HIM department? Jeannie? Well, of course, the TrackFast platform. <laughs> no, I couldn't resist. Sorry about that. <laughs> there, there are anybody who knows me <laughs> never mind um so just just to keep it real there are technologies that are, are are out there right now um that enable you know that function i would suggest it i i would strongly suggest you know to do a google search see what you can find um there are some good vendor solutions out there um, as well as some good partnerships between um requesters and um the him software vendors too. All right. Um, James, did you want to take a stab at that one too? Or? Yeah, I, th I think there are, um, you know, there are abilities to kind of centralize and, and work with. I mean, we try to be flexible in making other mm -hmm. solutions. I mean, we realize that, that not every location or, you know, especially some small rural hospitals um, not necessarily have an ROI vendor or, or a medical release um, company that they use. And so really we're flexible in allowing different opportunities to try to get that request to them and then make it as easy as possible for them to get the request uh, rec requested records to us. And so again, we're happy to get on the phone and kind of talk through what is best practices for that particular location. Okay. So is there a centralized solution to provide feedback on claims coding results? James, we'll go with you on that one. Sure, so when we complete a, a review, we do send a um, the results directly into or back to the hospital as well as, as to the health plan um, so that they both have that information and that's true prepay or postpay. The, I guess I would say is a challenge is you know, knowing where in the hospital um, that needs to go. And so um, I think it goes back early on when we were talking about the record requests, you know, they end up on eight different desks. And so we all, a lot of times we're sending to the known address that we have or, or the delivery model that was told to us by the health plan. And then six months down the road, we get a request to say, hey, we haven't gotten any of your reviews, so can you submit you know, six months worth of reviews and send them all to this email address? And so you, you work through a centralized process, and it's definitely part of our implementation strategy, but I think that is um, something that would benefit across the board is a centralized place for that information to go. Thank you. All right, so there has been a lot of talk of prepay. You know, what are some of the challenges of moving all audits to prepay? Jeannie? I'm actually gonna differ, um, ask James to address that one. That's his area of expertise. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, th I think, um, and I don't wanna rehash things we've already said, but I think, you know, with prepay, I think it's really being able to understand that a I'll back up so in the atomized bill world when you're bill, talking to the central billing office or talking to the billing office th we see a lot of times where the request that we're talking to that person they understand the differences hey I got a request over here from this organization but it's a postpay request and I've got a request over here for this organization and it's prepay that prepay needs to be done first because that's dollars back to the hospital so that, that bill can be processed. And I don't know that because of the historical side of the HIM department and the medical record request, I'm not sure that that is something that's in the norm yet. And so I think, again, it goes back to communication and being able to understand that if we were to move all audits prepay, the quote unquote urgency that would need to be had within the 
the medical records department to say, I've got 10 requests in front of me, but I need to process these three first because they're prepaid. Maybe they came in today and your your postpay ones came in yesterday, but I'm going to work the prepay ones first to get those requests out because, again, it's, it's revenue or dollars to back to the hospital the sooner those audits can be completed. And so, again, I think it's just sitting down and understanding workflows and understanding requests so that those can take priority and then the reviews could be moved prepaid. Great, well, I think that was it for questions, unless we do have any from the audience, I'll give you a couple seconds to type that in. I think that's it. Um, thank you guys so much um, for this conversation today, and we appreciate everybody joining us. Um, we will be producing um, a white paper um, summarizing today's conversation and um, we'll be sharing with that that with this audience um, when it's available. So again, thank you everyone and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks everybody. Bye, Bye. Take care.